Hello, America. Wow, it's been a heck of the week for the mainstream media, hasn't it? Let me just start, oh, let me think, uh, maybe with the Moab bomb that the Durham investigation dropped on the Steele dossier just a couple of days ago. Okay, not only was it revealed that Christopher Steele's primary source was fabricating and even outright lying in some cases, and they're not the small cases, they're the big ones, but one of his sources was not Russian. One of his sources was a longtime aide for both Bill and Hillary Clinton. And guess what? Even he was lying about some things. Okay. All right. I haven't heard really much more than a peep out of the mainstream media on this one. Largely silent on this crime. I did, however, find the addition from the Washington Post somewhat revealing here. Uh, allegations cast new uncertainty on some past reporting on the dossier by news organizations, including the Washington Post. <laughs> you think? The media reported on the dossier as if it were fact. Put the country through hell for four years. It's not even accurate to call it the Steele dossier because it's the Clinton dossier. And, and part of probably the most egregious example of election interference in the history of our country. Okay, there's story one. Story two also strangely has something to do a little bit with the media. Let me fast forward to a couple of days ago to the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. The media for months framed Rittenhouse this way. Kenosha shooter Kyle Rittenhouse, he murdered two people, by the way. Rittenhouse is basically what you would have had in a school shooter. He's a 17-year-old kid. He shouldn't have had a gun. He crossed state lines to supposedly protect property. No, he was going out to shoot people. Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old vigilante. Kyle Rittenhouse, a vigilante. Kyle Rittenhouse, the armed teenage vigilante. A 17-year-old vigilante, arguably a domestic terrorist, picked up a rifle, drove to a different state to shoot people. Kyle Rittenhouse, a guy yeah. who's deeply racist, went with weapons deeply to a racist. Black Lives Matter protest, looking to get in trouble. He did. He murdered a couple of people. Rittenhouse, uh, the 17-year-old kid, just running around, shooting and killing protesters. That's exactly what happened, just running around. Of course, none of them were playing the video at the time of saying that or giving it any other perspective. It was just vigilante, terrorist, murderer, and racist. Okay. Now I want to show you what came out in the trial. This is a Twitter trial, man. If you're watching it, it is clear. This is an eyewitness from that night, someone directly involved in chasing down Rittenhouse. This was his testimony just a couple of days ago. Watch. With your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't That's until you shoot. pointed your gun at him, advanced on him, with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, then he fired, right? Correct. So it's kind of like, hands up, don't shoot. I mean, I could let that go on, but the silence said everything. Uh, the prosecution, I mean, this was a prosecution witness. This was not a defense witness. This was cross-examination. This is the prosecution's witness. And look at what the face looked like of the prosecution. There it is. <laughs> oh, boy, are we in trouble here. How, how is that happening? How did this even make it? He admits that Rittenhouse only fired when his attackers chased him down, cursed at him, and pointed a gun at Rittenhouse. The trial is an absolute farce and should have never happened. And both of these examples are exhibits one and two of the groupthink hive mind between the political left and their surrogates in the mainstream media. They have no credibility anymore, With starting with the average person now. They don't get it. They don't see it. They don't understand. They don't want you to know the truth. They have made their bed with the truth, and they will just expect you now to follow blindly their agenda. Okay, well, no, not me, not me. Uh, I'm not going to comply, and neither will Blaze TV. Next Wednesday, I'm airing a live two-hour special on the biggest story of our lifetime. 
This has been uh, evidence that has been gather gathered over 18 months. Uh, several researchers in several countries. Uh, and we believe, well, everything that we say, we will back up with original documents. We will show you what happened. What is the origin of COVID-19? And who is involved? And was there a cover-up? No, not just from the Chinese, but was there a government up on our own government? Was the president lied to? I don't think it's going to make it on, uh, on YouTube. In fact, I'm not even sure that later in the show, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the chalkboard and just give you a little tease on what we're going to expose. Um, next week's chalkboard is probably the most important chalkboard I've ever done. Coincidentally, I think it may be the last one um, that our tech overlords will allow us to uh, do, at least on YouTube. So be it. Next Wednesday will be a big test. How far will big tech go to censor the truth and censor people from just asking simple questions? We have the answers. And we're reaching out. The reason why we're not doing this week is we're giving more time for people to respond to our requests. So is that really you? If you're not already subscribed, make sure you either subscribe right now or be ready to subscribe if YouTube cuts the feed next week or maybe even later at this uh, episode. Go to blazetv.com and use the promo code Fauci lied for $25 off your subscription. To kick all of this off, I want to take a look at another case of Democrat and mainstream media collusion, this time concerning your health, the vaccine mandates. Uh, by the way, I have a list somewhere in here of um, the like 40 things I cannot say. I cannot say. I've never had a list like that before. I've done this for 45 years. I've never had a list like that where I can and cannot say certain things. Never seen it before. This is starting to appear as a never-ending vaccine booster shot. Just like in the Rittenhouse case and the Steele dossier, the media and the government seem to be in lockstep. The media is a master at false consensus. It's one of their most common tricks. They push a narrative and then imply all the experts in the world are in agreement. You're just a dummy if you don't. They label anyone who disagrees a conspiracy theorist or a racist or a transphobe or whatever. It's really getting boring and predictable. Incredibly annoying as well. But it used to be effective. We've seen it in full force in the last year and a half, and now we're seeing it with the COVID-19 vaccine. Most articles about the vaccine boosters are practically press releases for the institutions that have strong-armed people into compliance. If you listen a little bit closer, you can hear the false consensus when they say, trust the science. What they actually mean is trust the scientists. Oh which I think actually translates to trust big pharma or trust big government. And if there's anything we have learned from the COVID-19 insanity, it is that we absolutely cannot trust the consensus of scientists. Because I'm not sure they're using the same rule on the scientific method anymore. The media rushed to tell us that the CDC has approved the vaccine for children's 5 to 11. Oh, goodness, that's great. The Washington Post wants you to know that Moderna wants you to know that the Moderna vaccine is safe for children. Well, thank you, Washington Post. Since when is it okay for a corporate institution to do the talking? More importantly, why should we trust the Washington Post when they're trusting Moderna? Why would a major news outlet push the good name of Big Pharma? Doesn't seem to make sense. For a few months, we heard a lot about the booster shot. Here's Dr. Fauci. This is one great. of the reasons that we believe the boost works is that you give the immune response mm -hmm. of the second shot enough time to mature and make it ready so that when you give a boost, it really jacks up the response oh, a lot. That's great. So remember, trust the science, but he's not talking about science. Remember, did you hear what he said at the very beginning? We believe that the boot, that's faith. And I'm not taking it on faith because you're not God. 
although some in the media may disagree. The CDC's talking about the boosters as well. I wonder if you can tell us exactly who you think should be getting those booster shots, what the plan is right now, and what does the data support here? How do you see this? We know that among the things that we need to do as we're planning a lot for booster shots is to really focus as well on the unvaccinated. So I really do want to highlight that while we are focusing on booster shots, we cannot take our eye off of making sure that people who are not yet vaccinated get vaccinated. So is the booster shot uh, safe? Well, NPR an arm of the government, says absolutely. They quote a doctor who says that, quote, there's very, very little risk, end quote. Another doctor quoted in the article says, we could barely quantify the risk, it's so low. So imagine my surprise when the New York Times ran an article titled, are vaccine boosters widely needed? Some federal advisors have misgivings. Now, a better headline is most federal advisors have misgivings. The article describes, quote, significant dissent and disquiet among those advisors about the need for booster shots in the United States, end quote. But CBS knows better. Watch. We want to start with a unanimous recommendation from unanimous. a CDC advisory panel on the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson COVID boosters. Oh, wow, that's great. Now, the panel barely approved the boosters for people in the age range of 18 to 49, but the booster recommendation for high-risk jobs didn't pass. The reality is the experts are downright uncomfortable not just with the booster. In fact, the booster was fairly obvious. They were afraid to descend because they didn't want mixed messaging. Mm, that sounds like science or propaganda. Quote, all the advisors acknowledged that they were obligated to make difficult choices based on sparse research in the middle of a public health emergency, end quote. The most important question is, do vaccinated people need the booster? The New York Times says no. The New York Times says no, or at least we don't have enough information. The data just isn't there. Overwhelmingly, the experts agreed that the boosters just don't seem necessary, let alone useful. Uh-oh, I think I violated. One of them said, quote, these are not evidence-based recommendations, end quote. Another, quote, I don't think that we have evidence that everybody in those groups needs a booster today, end quote. By the way, both of those experts initially voted in favor of the booster. So why would they do that? Why would they approve the booster? Surely they have your health in mind. Well, the New York Times steps down from her pedestal to tell us and mansplain it to us. The experts, quote, felt compelled to vote for the shots because of the way the federal agencies framed the questions that they were asked to consider. Other committee experts said that they wanted to avoid confusing the public further by dissenting or that they had voted according to their views of the evidence and they were simply overruled, end quote. Translation, even the experts who approved the boosters were skeptical. None of them believe in the booster. The reasons they voted to approve it are strictly political. This is what happens when you make politics into justice and uh, into sports and now your health. Are they concerned about your health? Do they, are they concerned about your child? Not children in general, your child. No, it seems as though they're more concerned with optics and marketing. So here's the most important question to ask. Who is pushing the booster? Because they're pushing it pretty hard. Two lines near the end of the New York Times piece kind of stand out. Quote, several panelists who did not wish to speak on the record said privately that the final recommendations for the booster shots were inevitable as soon as President Biden promised them to all adults. End quote. Inevitable? Is he like a Roman god? It's inevitable? One of the experts answered, why? Well, we're in a very difficult position, I'm quoting, to do much of anything other than what everyone has already announced that we've done. 
Wow, interesting use of a passive voice. Who did the announcing? And why are their announcements more influential and final than the consensus of the actual experts? Biden's vaccine mandates have currently been blocked by the federal appeals court. This fight is long from over because they don't care about the courts. Oh, it's rule of law and constitutional crisis. If a Republican would do anything close to this. But once the courts rule, ah, do it anyway. There are a few people that are taking a stand. A lot of people that are saying enough is enough. Blaze TV is one of them. And I'm going to talk to another big one, Ben Shapiro, next. Oh, I love Thanksgiving. Oh, some people would say family. Not me. Others would say food. Some would say football. Not me. Others would say food. Some would, some would say, you know, preparing and laughing in the kitchen. I would say the sleep on the couch right after the food. But you have to work to have a body like this. And uh, my wife uh, told me for about a year, you got to try Pilt Bar. You'll love them. You're going to love them. They're, they're, they're great. They're protein bars and they're healthy. And I'm like, I'm not, you just said the magic words. Not interested. And then she was gone, and uh, she was gone for the day, and uh, I didn't have anything to snack on, and uh, so I found her box of Built Bars. They were in the refrigerator, and I decided, and I ate it like this, <laughs> expecting it to be horrible, because everything really healthy for you is horrible, not these. Built Bar, fantastic, fantastic. So this holiday, mm, go ahead and snack, maybe replace some of the coconut cream pies with maybe the coconut bar dipped in real chocolate. Delicious. Um, go now to built.com. Use the promo code BEC15, BEC15, built.com. So now I'm just looking at all the rules. I'm not making this up. The rules on what I can say online uh, and the things I can't say, misinformation and will be booted off. And one of them is that, uh, you know, can't talk about any side effects. You know, what's really weird is because I've seen drug commercials on TV before. Um, let me show this one for uh, Zarelto. Watch this. See if you've noticed anything about these ads. While taking Zarelto, you may bruise more easily, and it may take longer for bleeding to stop. Mm. Zarelto may increase your risk of bleeding if you take certain medicines. Mm. Zarelto can cause serious bleeding, and in rare cases may be fatal. Get help right away if you develop unexpected bleeding, unusual bruising, or tingling. If you have had spinal anesthesia while on Zarelto, watch for back pain or any nerve or muscle-related signs or symptoms. What? <laughs> That sounds scary, right? All of them have a disclaimer like that. This particular one had that disclaimer. It, you know, went on the market. And, um, and then there was another commercial that was played just a little while after. Here it is. Attention, Zarelto and Prodaxa has been linked to internal bleeding. If you were hospitalized for internal bleeding or your loved one died from internal bleeding after taking Zarelto or Prodaxa, uh -huh. call now. Yeah, okay. All right. So when somebody says side effects, no side effects, shut your mouth. I don't tend to believe them. And since when is the government not interested in talking about every stupid little teeny, not a chance in hell side effect that could happen to you? They insist that all of those things. But now, no, 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 no. Okay. All right, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not a medical doctor, although that could be argued I am a doctor. I have my doctorate of humanities. Uh, and, uh, you know, humans get sick, so I should be able to treat them as far as I see. Um, the vaccines might be perfectly safe. That's not the point. The point is you should have all of the information, have access to all of the information, and the federal government doesn't have any business telling anyone what they must put into their bodies. Last week, the Daily Wire announced a lawsuit against the Biden administration over its OSHA mandate demanding to know just that. Daily Wire's editor uh, emeritus is Ben Shapiro. Hello, Ben. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's great. So uh, 
does the I, I can't find anything constitutional that allows the government to do this. Yeah, there, there are a bunch of problems here just from a legal perspective. So let's start with the most obvious. Joe Biden promulgated this OSHA rule under emergency temporary authorization. You, you can't really do that if you're going to announce four months in advance what the authorization is going to be. So he says emergency temporary standard is going to be promulgated under the OSHA rule. He says that two months before he releases a regulation, the regulation doesn't go into effect for another two months. So if I tell you there's an emergency at your house and your house is on fire, I will be sending the fire trucks maybe in two months. And then two <laughs> months from now, I say, I have a plan to send it in two months from then. At that point, you're going to say, I don't believe you that my house is on fire like right now and that it's an emergency. So that, that's number one. Uh, and they didn't go through any of the normal sort of regulatory strategy uh, steps that you have to go through in order to promulgate a permanent regulation here. They say they might do that later and it'll be much, much worse, by the way, like the, the actual strictures of the regulation under this 490 page OSHA rule, which are bad now, they say it could get a lot worse. They're saying that they might try to promulgate permanent masking for people who are vaccinated. They say they might try to get rid of the ability to test out completely. So you will have to vax or you'll be fired. Right? They're saying that might become permanent. OK, then you get to the issue of does the original enabling act for OSHA, does the original statute actually apply here? Meaning, was OSHA given the power to tell 100 million workers in the United States that either they have to get vaxxed or they have to get fired, or to tell employers across the United States that they must vaccinate or test all of their employees or be fined to this extent simply by regulation? Again, not by a piece of legislation, because the original piece of legislation doesn't include anything remotely like that. So the answer, of course, is no. There is nothing in here that suggests that OSHA has the capacity to do anything like this. This is not the equivalent of getting rid of asbestos at a construction no. site. This is saying that every single person who works for a company, over 100 people in the United States, has to get vaxxed or test or get fired for the possibility of getting a disease that you can voluntarily protect yourself from right now with a vaccine or maybe with a therapeutic or maybe you don't care. No, right? no, no, so, there's no and, and again, the chances of death from this yeah. are not one in three. The chances of death from this are very low depending on your age. So there's that problem as well. And then you get to the massive constitutional problem of can the federal government do this at all? The federal government does not have the capacity to do this stuff normally. Normally, if you have a, a vaccine mandate, it's going to happen from the state or locality, which has the normal health power, not the federal government. Correct. Correct. OK, so, A, do you think I mean, it, I mean, in a normal world, this would be clear cut uh, and the stay would have been, you know, executed by the president. He would have said, "Ah, oh, you know, the court said no. So we got to stop. The opposite has happened. And we're in some sort of weird parallel universe. Um, do you think that we have a chance of stopping this, that you uh, and the Daily Wire and others who join you can win this case? I think that the chances that we win this case are about 173 <laughs> percent. I'm, I'm very, very confident that we win this case. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has already put a stay on it. I think the Sixth Circuit is going to do the same thing. I think that this is going to end up elevated to the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court is going to knock this down almost immediately based on all of the factors that I've just stated. So I, I really have very little doubt that this regulation is going to be struck down pretty darn quickly. And uh, I'm, I'm yeah, again, I think that Joe Biden is really doing this for the same reason that he did the CDC eviction moratorium after being told it was unconstitutional. He wants to please the left wing base. He wants to please the media. He wants to be able to say, I did everything I could and then kind of keel over and everybody cheers. So is it that or is this um, are we to learn lessons I mean, I, I look back and, you know, one of the problems that the, the Nazis gained strength, not in 1930, the 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 discontent and the change of the culture of Germany really began in World War One. And so you had a bunch of people who were 20 and 30 that didn't remember the old republic. And I think of the kids that are alive today that, you know, you, you'll be 20 and you're you don't remember 9-11. You don't remember real freedom before the Patriot Act. Now you're growing up and the government can tell you to stay inside, to mask, to close your schools, to force you to get a vaccine. Gosh, Ben, I mean, in four or five years, you've got a cold culture that is a zombie uh, to the power in Washington. I mean, I totally agree with that. So I think that if, if the last year and a half showed us anything, it's how quickly human beings are able to adapt to their circumstances and start treating them as normal. I remember when the pandemic first started, I was talking to my business partner over here, Jeremy Boring, and Jeremy said, I don't think the American people are going to stand for these lockdowns and masking for more than three months. And I said, I, I think they'll stand for it until there's a vaccine. 
And as it turns out, a lot of the American public will stand for it forever, right? Because the, the, the bottom line for a lot of people is they believe that the government has a magic button that can solve all of their problems. And in an almost paganistic fashion, if you believe, if you clap hard enough for Tinkerbell, then Tinkerbell will live. If you clap hard enough for the federal government, the federal government will solve COVID. And, and if you believe that, then you'll believe pretty much anything. Whatever the government tells you to do, you must do. This is, by the way, reflected in the media coverage, right? If somebody believes in the purview of the federal government and got vaccinated and then got COVID through a breakthrough case like Jen Psaki, there are no articles about how she sort of had it coming. But if Brett Kavanaugh, right, who was vaccinated, gets a breakthrough case, you'll get a lot of, well, he deserved it. Really? He got vaccinated. What do you mean he deserved it? The answer is he might not have the same philosophy of government. He doesn't worship at the same pagan altar. And therefore, the great God of COVID has come in and smote him. So this is really st this stems from uh, Woodrow Wilson and the, you know, the administrative state and, and, you know, Philip Drew administrator, all that stuff that he went through. Um, and they, they finally have the administrative state big enough. Congress just said, no, no, no. We'll let the secretary decide what the real law is. They can define it. Um, do you think that because of this, there's a chance that we dig a little deeper into things like OSHA or begin to strip these these agencies of some of this out of control power that they have no right to do? I mean, I certainly hope so. I think that if Republicans regain the presidency in 2024, this has to be top priority. It, it, the Trump administration did a lot of good things. One of the things that it didn't do is clean out the administrative agencies and really restrict their purview as much as it should have. And that has to be priority number one. I'm actually kind of hopeful that this OSHA case results in what would be kind of a great thing, which would be the Supreme Court striking down the notion of Chevron deference. So Chevron deference is a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court essentially declared that administrative agencies get to adjudicate the scope of their own authority. So if there's a big statute like the OSHA statute, right. the, the group that gets to adjudicate how broad the OSHA statute, it is, uh, statute is, is OSHA. So if you <laughs> challenge OSHA, you go to an OSHA administrative court right. where OSHA decides whether OSHA has done the right thing. And under Chevron deference, the Supreme Court basically said, we're not going to review that de novo. We, we were not in a position to really say what they can and cannot do. They're the experts. Uh, I'd love to see that struck down. I think there's a majority on the Supreme Court to do that. So if Joe Biden ends up rake stepping in this sort of way, if he actually promulgated this regulation, steps on that rake and the Supreme Court bashes him in the face with getting rid of Chevron deference, uh, I think that'd be a net win. Um, let me change uh, subjects here for just a second. Rittenhouse, Ben, you're an attorney. Uh, I, uh, but I've just been a news watcher. I've done this job for 40 plus years. I have never seen some of the things I'm seeing from the Rittenhouse trial. I, I've, I've never seen the prosecution's witnesses basically go, yeah, he was afraid for his life. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. What the hell is happening? I mean, it should, the, the fact that this trial is even happening should scare the living hell out of every law-abiding American, truly, because you sort of assumed maybe the prosecutor knew something we didn't. And then it turns out the prosecutor did not know anything that we didn't. In fact, the prosecutor knows less than his own witnesses. Right. Right. He, he, he had he had no case. I mean, he, he gets up there and he's asking his own witnesses. What were you bending over when Rittenhouse shot you? He said, no, I was lunging for the gun. <laughs> right? He's asking right. his own witnesses. Was he in Were you when you were approaching him? Where was where was your gun? Did you drop it? He's like, no, I didn't drop it. I lied to the cops about that. I was actually pointing my gun at him when he shot me. Like those are the so prosecution who, witnesses. So which suggests whose fault is this? Is this the prosecution for not standing up? Is this the mayor? Is this Twitter mobs? What what where does the where does the buck stop on this one? Well, I mean, in, in, in the first instance, the prosecution, right? Because you do have prosecutorial discretion to decide whether or not you wish to bring a case. And normally you don't bring a case unless you think there's a pretty good shot that you're going to win it. Prosecutors don't like to lose. So the prosecutor should have never brought this case in the first place. But then the question becomes, why did he? And the answer is because the entire media infrastructure suggested that Kyle Rittenhouse was a, was a white supremacist who went out to Kenosha, Wisconsin in order to murder people that night. And that this was not a clear cut case of self-defense, even though we had the tape. This is all on tape. Anybody who watched that tape from the very beginning knew that at the very least, is there a reasonable doubt about self-defense? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And then it turns out that the case comes and not only is there a reasonable doubt about self-defense, there's no doubt that, that it was self-defense. It was yeah. clearly self-defense. Yeah. And, and the, watching the judge just excoriate the prosecutor for even bringing the case is, is kind of, an, would you, I've never seen anything like that. Would you, would you have had Kyle Rittenhouse testify? I mean, they were winning. 
That's a huge risk. Why did he testify? And he broke down. I thought he did very, very well, but he he broke down and it was very emotional. Why would you do that as his attorney? I mean, I'm kind of shocked that the attorney allowed it. The judge even sort of warned Rittenhouse, you know, you don't you don't have to do this. Uh, first rule of being an attorney is if you don't have to have your client testify, don't have your client testify. And in this case, it was pretty obvious the prosecution had failed to meet its burden. I think maybe the prosecutor was looking for a directed verdict. So he gets Rittenhouse up there and he says, the, not only has the, the prosecution not made its case, you've got nothing, like really nothing. You can't even ask a single question that implicates the defendant in any of this sort of conduct. And you skip the jury altogether. You don't have to put the guy on the stand to do that, though. He'd already attempted to move for a directed verdict. But okay. it's definitely a risky move anytime you put a defendant on the stand, for sure. Okay, that makes sense. I thought you could only do it after the prosecution rested. That's when the defense can say, can we have this case dismissed? And he chose to go on. But he did ask for that. And he can ask uh, yeah, for that, it again. Yeah, that happened earlier. So, yeah, he, he had, so that, that was earlier. Uh, the, when, when one of the witnesses said in open court that he was pointing his gun at Rittenhouse and Rittenhouse shot him, immediately the, the, the defense attorney says, directed verdict, Your Honor, <laughs> because there, there's, there's no case. But yeah, I mean, as a lawyer, I was, I was kind of surprised to see Rittenhouse testify. And obviously, uh, Rittenhouse acquitted himself well because it's pretty obvious there's no case here. R one last question, Ben. I'm sorry to keep you on this, but... Um, did you see the the argument between the prosecutor and the uh, and the judge today? Uh, there were several of them. I mean, the prosecutor kept attempting to reopen evidence that the judge had already ruled out of order, and he was doing so in front of the jury. He he was attempting to to essentially bring into evidence things that were completely extraneous to the case, just in order to kind of dirty up Rittenhouse, and the judge wasn't having any of it. And you can already see the the traditional media leap into action, right? They're, they're starting to attack the judge now. Now that the prosecutor has no case, they're immediately going to, this judge is biased. This is all because of the judge. The judge is terrible. The reality is the prosecution has no case. The media, if the media get a riot out of this, I guess they got what they wanted because that's the way they've been covering it. Yeah. If you saw the headlines after some of the testimony, yeah. the headlines in no way resembled the testimony. The None. testimony was, I was pointing a gun at Rittenhouse and Rittenhouse shot me. That's the headline. The headline instead was, I feared for my life. I'm sorry, that's not, that is not in any way the testimony that matters. Does Kenosha burn if he's if he's found not guilty? Um, I, I think that the uh, cops in Kenosha are going to be very loath to let Kenosha burn this time. Good. I hope so. Thank you so much, Ben. Appreciate it. Up next, I'm going to go to the chalkboard, give you a sneak peek of what uh, what we're going to do next week, um, and uh, and to give you a little insight on how much work has gone into this to make sure it's right. That's next. So, um, you know, the Fed said, oh, that, you know, inflation, it's still going to be fine. It says transitory. They came out today and said, uh, it may not be transitory. Really? Do you think so? We have 5.8% inflation. That's what they say it's going to be. Um, uh, however, if you use all the same numbers and you just calculate it the way we did in 1980, you know, with Jimmy Carter, uh, we're at about 14.1. If you want to do it the way they calculated it with Bill Clinton, it's about 8.5. Now it's only, it's barely at five. Well, you're just changing the rules. Kraft, uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese and everything Kraft Heinz makes going up by 20%. I'd say that's a problem. It doesn't work to print money like this. It doesn't work. But unfortunately, we have four years of madness and if the dollar survives, it's going to be barely hanging on. You need something to protect your investment, the money that you have, even the money that you um, uh, are saving in the bank for, you know, a rainy day. Please put some of that money and hedge your bet. Put it into something that is real and tangible. May I recommend gold, gold line. I've been talking about these guys for a very long time. I put my money where my mouth is. I believe, and especially now silver, I believe silver is going to become very important, and so will gold. When all else fails, that's where the world goes to. They're offering 6% free metals with any self-qualifying directed IRA acquisition. Call today. Find out how to use a portion of your IRA or 401k or other retirement vehicle to acquire 
physical precious metals. And this week, just for uh, completing the application for a self-directed IRA, Goldline will give you for free one of their branded one ounce silver bars. Uh, inventory is limited. Call them now, 866-GOLDLINE, 866-GOLDLINE or goldline.com. I want to bring in um, a good friend and a trusted friend and uh, the head writer of the program and chief researcher of the program, Jason Batril. Hi, Jason. Hi. Um, you have been working uh, now uh, with a team that has been working all around the world for how long have they been doing this, looking into COVID-19? I would say near the beginning, near the when beginning. things started seeming a little funky. Right. And they are a collection of people, the, some of them uh, former military, some of them, many of them scientists, yep. other just full out geeks that are like, wait <laughs> a minute, I got to find that information. Um, and we were dumped all this information and then tried to put it into a story form. Um, it is a very difficult story if you look at the whole ocean. Um, but we've tried to make this um, something that you'll be able to understand next Wednesday night, a two-hour live special, commercial-free. We are going to show you. Um, was the COVID uh, search for a vaccine and search for truth, was it ever really, truly honest? Um, and the, some of the things that I just want to take, take over and, and show you here is there were a few things that didn't make sense right from the beginning. For instance, 15 days to flatten a curve. Great. We were all freaking out. Nobody knew what was coming our way. They were welding people in, Chicago, in uh, China. So we got it. Um, then it was, well, it'll have to be till Easter. And then it was, well, it'll have to be until we get a vaccine. Then when we got the vaccine, well, no, we have to have everybody. No, we have to have herd immunity, 80%. Then it was, we have to have everybody, even the children, even the infants now. Something is not right. Does that feel right to you? The fact that I can't talk about anyone that has had any side effect whatsoever of the vaccine or the booster shots and not get banned? Does that seem right to you? Um, the new normal. I remember hearing, you know, after we have a new normal, and I think, I don't want a new normal. I want to go back to normal. Has it s struck you as strange that medicines, for instance, the dewormer, is a medicine that won the Nobel Prize. Hydroxychloroquine has been out forever. Let me show you what the media has said about these two. The largest study to date of its kind shows that hydroxychloroquine does more bad than good for coronavirus patients. And the study of 96,000 hospitalized coronavirus patients on six continents found that those who received that drug promoted by Donald Trump as a, quote, game changer in the fight against the virus had a significantly higher risk of death. Taking hydro, um, hydroxychloroquine, despite mounting evidence that it doesn't work against COVID. COVID-19 and could in fact be harmful. Mr. Trump said his hydroxychloroquine treatment would likely end today. The same day, a leading medical journal, The Lancet, warned not only does the drug not offer benefits, it could cause harm. That moved on from absurd and sort of insane to potentially to a potentially deadly threat today when The Lancet published the results of a new study. But a new study published in the medical journal The Lancet today says the drug did not help hospitalize coronavirus patients. Instead, that study says it made them more likely to die. It blows my mind that Joe Rogan just yesterday admitted to taking ivermectin. Ivermectin is something more often used to deworm horses. Rogan telling his 13 million Instagram followers that he was treated with several drugs and he included ivermectin on the list, a drug used for livestock. Rogan said the word ivermectin. Yes, that's the deworming medicine made to kill parasites and farm animals. The things are clearly bad. Unbelievable. But they're being made even worse by people who have refused to take the vaccine and instead are swallowing horse paste. Wait, 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 wait a second. He, he said that he got better because he ate he said cattle he's deworm. You have individuals like Joe Rogan, for example, who, uh, who don't want to take an experimental vaccine, but will take horse dewormer. <laughs> okay. 
So whether or not those drugs are effective for COVID-19, honestly, at this point, I don't even know because I don't know who to believe anymore. But the virulence that came at these drugs or any drug that seems to lessen uh, the effects, they always seem to be dismissed. That, that, and that's one of the things that really didn't make sense. That was one of the things that was kicking off alarm bells. Like, why are they diminishing treatments? Even even ta the talk of treatments, right? Like, obviously, always consult your doctor on anything you're going to take. Correct. But why come out in lockstep with the government to dismiss these treatments? Now, when this was first happening, especially with the hydroxy, I, w I thought it was just an attack on Donald Trump. That's what I, I thought. I did, too. I did, too. I think the majority of people did. Yeah, like, oh, well, they're, they're just doing it because Donald Trump mentioned it's it. It's not. And that's something that we found out in doing mm -hmm. this. It goes way beyond just attacking Donald Trump. So, uh, yeah, way beyond attacking Donald Trump. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine never mm. made sense to me. It was the same kind of side effects uh, with the other vaccines, and they pull it off the market immediately. And if you look at the charts, the vaccine rate for Americans was on a steep incline. The day they canceled Johnson & Johnson, it went down and it's never recovered. So why did they cancel the Johnson & Johnson? Watch. They are calling for that pause on the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after six recipients developed a rare six. disorder involving blood clots about two weeks after getting vaccinated. Here's what we know about those six people who developed that rare disorder. They were all women between the ages of 18 and 48. One woman died. A second woman in Nebraska is in the hospital and in critical condition. Okay, there is, a, which I can't mention because of the rules, there are pilots that don't want to take the vaccine because very rare cases you can have a problem with your heart. Yeah. Okay. Very rare cases. So it's a, such a long shot that you would get it. That's six cases for Johnson and Johnson. Why do they not care about the very rare side effects of the vaccine? Yeah, and, and that, this was happening when similar reports were happening amongst all the big three vaccines, the Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. But for some reason, they singled out Johnson & Johnson. Right. And we were talking about that, I remember at the time, too, that it just seemed odd. Well, there is one no, thing... No, 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 no. Okay, 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 go ahead. Okay, okay, Listen, um, this, is, this is in the beginning of the show. Yeah. So, like, I mean, right off the top, you're probably going to want to sit down. You're probably going to be mad. Yeah, very mad, very mad. Uh, more in just a second. But I will tell you that it all will make sense to you. Everything that you went, that doesn't seem right. That's next Wednesday. More in a minute. Um, if you're a dog owner, you know taking care of your pet means giving him more than just food and water. A dog is a part of our family. Uh, his health and his happiness are really important to all of us. I mean, at least unless you're a bad dog owner. Um, I've been telling you a while about Rough Greens. It's changed Uno's life. It really has. It used to be the pickiest eater in the world. It's actually maybe changed my life almost as much as his because we had to stand next to him frozen like a statue until he finished eating everything or he'd stop and that was your last chance. I don't have to do that anymore. And he's much more active and just he's more fun. He wants to play all the time. He's running hard and... He's an old German Shepherd. He's almost 10, and that's getting up there for a German Shepherd. Rough Greens is a supplement that you sprinkle on top of whatever you feed your dog, all kinds of vitamins, minerals, probiotics, antioxidants, basically everything that your dog is missing out on. Uh, the dogs love it. Look, to make sure yours does, you can get a free bag of, uh, sample bag of Rough Greens. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Just go to roughgreens.com slash Beck or call 833-GLENN-33, roughgreens.com slash Beck. We are never going to get to all of these things, the things that didn't, just don't make sense. When you understand these three things, and we're going to put a, um, three chalkboards together and then merge them into one, they're three different timelines. Um, explain briefly, arms race. It's so important to understand the arms race because... Because you have to know where this originally started. They wanted to make you think that this started 
basically December 31st, you know, 2019. Mm -hmm. This goes back way further than that. And then when you understand why they were doing this uh, vaccine arms race, you understand it, all the different people that are involved, right. the different labs that are involved, Correct. and how they all work together. And this is not, this is not, they didn't weaponize nothing. It actually starts out kind of controversial, but good intentions, good intentions. on all involved, okay? The pandemic begins. Right, so this is, we have compiled a ton of internal documents directly from within labs that mm -hmm. show that there was some shadiness going on <laughs> in multiple different places. Right. But to, you have to analyze the people that were involved and when that pandemic actually begins, when you overlay those, you see that, okay, well, these people were talking to these people, this is how they're reacting to very specific things. See, what most people did is they looked at the, um, the, um, the, the documents, the Fauci emails, and that's all they looked at, and they were redacted. Well, if you go to those emails and you get a FOIA for the people that were BCC'd or CC'd, you get a whole new set of documents, same thing, but what, what, what we found was that they're not uh, redacted the same way. So if you have three or four emails and they're all redacted differently, you can pretty much put it all together. And when you look at what was happening behind the scenes, it leads you to crime and cover up. Um, it is a, uh, you know, I've done a dangerous show before. I did it on George Soros, and I knew that everything I said had to be 100% right. And, um, and they have been. I stand by everything I've ever done on George Soros. This one is probably uh, more important because the world is at war with anyone that is searching for the truth. This has very little to do with the vaccines or the treatments or anything else. This has everything to do with how can we ever find the truth if we're not willing to actually look for the truth. That's something that I don't think has actually happened. There's been a few, but they've been destroyed. Yeah. Early on, they were destroyed, and we will show you what they were saying, what they were looking for, and then show you what we found. So arms race, pandemic begins, crime and cover up. It's going to be at a special time. Ricky, that is at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. And then it's a two hour live special, no commercials. And then it will be followed by a roundtable hosted by uh, Steve Dace. You do not want to miss it. Put this on your calendar next Wednesday night. Stay inside and stay with us for the evening and uh, tell a friend. You might even want to bring a few friends over to the house because it is information you will not get anywhere else. Tomorrow morning, we'll bring you fresh and new perspective on the Rittenhouse trial on radio. Uh, until then, good night, America.